Hello and welcome to Noon Conferences hosted by MRI Online. In response to the changes happening around the world right now and the shutting down of in-person events, we have decided to provide free daily Noon Conferences to all radiologists worldwide. Today we are joined by Dr. Brent Little. He is a fellowship trained in cardiothoracic imaging, a member of the Division of Thoracic Imaging and Intervention at Massachusetts General Hospital, and is also an assistant program director for, for the radiology residency. He is interested in a variety of research topics and has published articles on pulmonary infections, lung cancer screening, diffuse lung disease, and cardiac and vascular imaging. A reminder that there will be time at the end of this hour for a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature to ask all questions and we will get to as many as we can before our time is up. That being said, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Little. I will let you take it from here. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thank you to Dr. Collins for inviting me to give this webinar today. So. I'll be talking about COVID-19, a topic that everyone is talking about right now. And um, I just wanted to remind you the views that I have in my talk are my own. They do not represent my own institution or any other national entity. And I'd just like to start by saying that I'll talk about today um, COVID-19 and the virus that causes the disease of COVID-19, that is SARS coronavirus 2, interchangeably today. So when I say a patient was positive, I simply mean they tested positive for SARS coronavirus 2, and um, they may have the disease known as COVID-19, which is still poorly understood and could be a collection of different diseases involving different body parts and organ systems. Now, of course, this is a chart of the total number of cases in the world of um, COVID-19. Um, and you can see that this little inflection point on February 11th, that's the time at which we thought that the um, epidemic in China might be leveling off. But unfortunately, because of uh, growth of cases around the world, this is the curve that we have now that continues to go up over 2 million cases. Now, there's been absolutely astounding media engagement of this particular topic, obviously, as a pandemic, a very, very devastating pandemic. And you can see that um, this is the total number of articles in the popular press that have been published. Four 0.5 million articles since January 1st. And you can see that each of these bars represents one day of articles. And the scale is in 100,000 articles. So you can see that on some days at the peak, um, we have over 120,000 articles published per day. These are the media, social media engagements of those articles. And you can see that that's measured in billions. So potentially billions of people have been tweeting and posting Facebook messages about these very articles. So astounding media engagement. This is a friend of mine, a thoracic radiologist um, uh, by the name of Adam Bernheim. You may have heard of him. He's from Mount Sinai. He was part of the first publication, spearheaded the first publications on the imaging appearance on CT of, um, at that time, just uh, the coronavirus, novel coronavirus 2019. And I cannot remember a time when another radiologist was able to go on CNN Live on the news, talk to Chris Cuomo, and have a national audience talking about the appearance of anything on a CT scan. So just astounding media engagement. But just like any other, uh, in any other pandemic or important world event, there's a lot of controversy about the role of various um, modalities. And that's been true especially of COVID-19. These are two recently published editorials by uh, some of these uh, folks are friends of mine, good friends of mine, on uh, the role of CT and being a little bit critical of some of the published articles. And so these are good to reference. And I'm going to present what I think is a very balanced account of recently published articles and of the role of CT. So what I'm going to do, and you can see that one of these is ironically entitled um, uh, chest CT detection of coronavirus disease 2019, don't rush the science. And so you may argue that actually you do want to rush the science in the setting of a pandemic. So today I'll be talking about the role of PCR and CT and about a little bit of the controversy of, of CT use, about the role of chest radiographs as primary modes of imaging. We'll talk about the various CT appearances of um, COVID-19. And we'll talk about the use of CT particularly as a problem solving tool and primarily is not a primary mode of diagnosis. Now, why is COVID-19 such a difficult disease to deal with? Well, in part because the symptoms can be very nonspecific. They can range from very typical symptoms like fever, cough, sore throat, to less typical symptoms like fatigue, GI symptoms, neuro neurologic symptoms, including confusion, 
and changes in mental status and even conjunctivitis that's been recently reported. And as we'll talk about, a lot of patients can be asymptomatic and have absolutely no symptoms, as was evidenced by those um, passengers and crew of the Diamond Princess cruise ship and other cruise ships. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But what is the role of PCR, uh, the polymerase chain reaction laboratory test that is used to assess for the presence of the virus that causes, um, that causes COVID-19? Well, let's explain it this way. Um, we can have patients with presenting with no symptoms or being asymptomatic, and then they can become symptomatic. Some, some never become symptomatic, but many do. And then they can convalesce and symptoms can abate. But um, PCR, uh, let's put it this way, can be positive with um, asymptomatic patients and then can become negative or can be negative even in symptomatic patients um, for a first test. So you can actually be tested and be negative on the PCR even though you have the virus and you're, you are symptomatic. You can then uh, test positive, a couple of positives on PCR, and then even while you're still symptomatic, with the virus can test negative again for, um, for SARS coronavirus too. And even when you convalesce, when you're discharged from the hospital, you can test negative on PCR. And it's been well documented recently that you can test positive even days later, um, even when you're asymptomatic. So the role of imaging. In theory, if you had a test that was persistently positive throughout all these time points, a test like, for example, CT, where we know that the findings, once they appear, don't um, take, take weeks to resolve in some cases. You could presumably have a test that turns positive at some point if it does turn positive, and then it remains positive throughout all these time points. So when you miss a, um, assessing the, for the coronavirus uh, with a negative PCR, you could presumably still at that time point have a positive CT. So that could be one role of imaging meaning we could pick up some sensitivity points throughout this entire time course and um, presumably mitigate these missed opportunities at PCR because, for example, the PCR doesn't um, have an adequate sample or because the virus is not shedding during those time points. And so I think that the interesting thing to learn about asymptomatic versus, as versus symptomatic people is from the Diamond Princess. And of course, that's the cruise ship where the first passenger who disembarked on February 1st from that cruise ship who developed symptoms of COVID-19 caused the entire ship to be quarantined for several weeks. And the interesting thing is that this is a so-called pure cohort because it wasn't just a random testing of people here. Everyone was tested, um, just about everyone was tested, passengers and crew on this ship. And for a while, it was actually uh, listed, and it's still listed on the Worldometer um, uh, site, website count of coronavirus cases. It's listed adjacent to countries, and it used to be listed as, a, um, as the first, um, you know, most frequent site of infection because it had so many patients when other countries did not. But now it's listed next to Cyprus and Latvia and Andorra. And you can see that there were over 3,700 passengers and crew on that ship and 712 of them tested PCR positive for the virus. Out of those, 27% at time of presentation had absolutely no symptoms. Later, that went down to about 18% because then some percentage of those patients became symptomatic, but 73% showed no symptoms at all um, in, in the early period. There were seven deaths, and so that means that the case for how, uh, case fatality rate was only 1.1%, which is well above that of the seasonal flu, but it's well below that of the 3% that has been quoted by the WHO and by some other organizations. So the interesting thing for us as imaging uh, specialists is um, this. Uh, what do you think? These are three patients from that particular article in radiology cardiothoracic imaging um, with abnormalities on their chest CTs. This one has quite a bit of ground glass opacity, a little bit of consolidation, it's a peripheral distribution. This one has just a little bit. You might wonder if this patient is asymptomatic, this one might be symptomatic. And then we have quite a bit of ground glass peripheral opacity that has a typical pattern here. So which of these patients was symptomatic, had symptoms? Well, would it surprise you that all of these, every single one of these patients was absolutely symptom-free at the time of these chest CTs?
that's really remarkable when you consider how much abnormality there is on some of these chest CTs. So as a um, chest radiologist, it's interesting when somebody comes down or calls me in the reading room and says, well, you know, given this sort of pattern and the absence of symptoms, um, do you think this could be something else? Well, it could be a lot of things as we're gonna talk about in a second, it's not a specific pattern, but the one thing I cannot do, I can't exclude um, COVID-19 simply because of the absence of symptoms. What about this case? Um, this is the same case we saw, asymptomatic woman. Um, and let's remind ourselves from this article, there were 104 patients who were included. And let's look at the presence of symptoms and the presence of some sort of CT abnormality in these patients. What about if you had symptoms? Well, 79% of those uh, patients actually went on to have a positive CT and 21% actually presented with a negative CT. What about if you had no symptoms? Well, in that case, it, astoundingly, 54% of the patients who were asymptomatic without any symptoms actually had a positive chest CT. But look at this, um, there were 46% who had no, no symptoms and had a negative uh, CT. So that means that a negative chest CT does not mean that you do not have COVID-19 um, and you do not carry uh, the SARS coronavirus too. What is the gold standard? Well, I think most people would accept that the gold standard is laboratory testing, is PCR. And several publications have studied the sensitivity for various forms of sampling of samples for PCR. And you, you see the results here for pharyngeal swabs, nasal swabs, and sputum samples. And in general, the nasopharyngeal swabs or nasal swabs are between 60 and 70% sensitive. Now, there are over 300 different types of PCR testings, uh, testing going on right now. And there's the recently um, uh, promulgated uh, rapid testing. And all these things have very different uh, sensitivities, but they're, they're within this, this range for many of the tests. Some are better, some are a little bit worse. And remember that BAL fluid, um, that is even more sensitive and sputum samples are more sensitive. And you can see that that is 93 and 72% sensitive in this particular study. But we've heard a lot in the radiology literature about the sensitivity of chest CT. So wouldn't it be good just to run all of our patients through the chest CT scanner and see if they have um, uh, COVID-19 or not? And a lot of these studies have quoted very high sensitivities. This particular study in radiology, um, by these authors is a famous one now. And they, um, what is quoted in the media is a 97% sensitivity, and that's what people uh, were really excited about. I'd like to point out that that's not really the whole story of this article. Uh, you can see that um, this 97% sensitivity figure, this is actually out of the first PCR that was done and that was positive in a certain number of patients, and that's in 580 patients. There were also 21 patients who had a positive PCR with a negative CT. So what that means is that only a very small number of this group who had a first positive PCR actually had a negative chest CT. That means there were very few false negatives in the chest CT group, only 3%. But that's not all that we wanna know. We wanna know about the patients who had um, a first negative PCR and how did CT help us in those patients? Because that's what we're encountering in clinical practice. We well, can see in this group, what happened was that um, they, they looked at this group again, but they didn't look with PCR. They um, did a clinical assessment. They looked again at the imaging. They looked at the symptoms and the course, and they decided whether they thought it was highly likely the patient had um, the virus, um, COVID-19, and 33% were possible cases, 19% were deemed uncertain. So if you look at this group though, remember that this group is not PCR based. So PCR was not the gold standard in this particular group. So that's very interesting. The other interesting thing, and the thing that we really wanna know about is what about the patients who had a first PCR that was negative and then had additional PCRs that were positive? How does CTR, CT do in those cases? Well, in this case, we had um, that group and we had only five patients uh, we had 15 patients in that group, but five of those, about a third, or, or actually one third, had a normal CT, which means that a normal CT actually in this group cannot be used to reliably exclude the presence of the virus. In fact, one third of those patients we relied on CT would have been missed, would have been called normal, when in fact they had COVID-19. So that's very interesting. Here's another uh, study that's quoted most often, and um, this came out a little bit earlier, and it quoted a 98% sensitivity for CT 
in picking up um, SARS coronavirus to patients. And we had 51 patients in that study. They all presented with symptoms. They all had some sort of exposure to Wuhan or to someone who had um, had a contact there. And they were done with the PCR that was done within three days of the CT in question. And they found um, that 50 of those CTs were actually abnormal. And that's a very high rate of abnormality, right? The problem is that in that study, the threshold for calling something abnormal a CT was very low. And you can see that this was called abnormal. Now, it is peripheral and it is ground glass and there's a little bit of consolidation. So conceivably, this could be um, COVID-19. But remember, this could also be a pulmonary infarct. This could be some other type of pneumonia. This could be a lot of other things. This could be organizing pneumonia from anything. This one was called positive two. Look at these just small ground glass and solid mixed attenuation nodules here. These could have been anything ranging from malignancy to any other infectious or inflammatory cause. What about this one? This one was also published from their article. This is a single opacity. It's a little subsolid nodule. Um, and this could have been anything. So the price that you pay for getting a lot of uh, sensitivity is a lack of specificity. So in this case, in this article, a lot of things were called positive that probably in clinical practice may not have been thought to be definitely pro positive. Now, I think that there are several points that we, all, we can all agree on. And one of them is that PCR um, is the primary method of diagnosis of COVID-19. And chest radiographs, if any imaging is gonna be done, um, they are probably gonna be the first uh, form of imaging at many institutions. But these things, none of these things are 100% sensitive. We can also agree that CT from the literature has a higher sensitivity than chest radiographs. That's, that's something that everyone is agreement with. Um, and also we can agree that CT is not the gold standard um, above PCR because it does miss cases. They're actually positive cases. And here's such a case. This is a completely negative CT. And you can see this patient had one of the other organ manifestations of COVID-19 that's been appreciated recently, and that's conjunctivitis, eye disease. Um, what does the American College of Radiology recommend? Well, as most of you know, uh, the ACR has guidelines that say that CT should not be used for screening or first-line diagnosis of COVID-19, and that CT should be used sparingly and reserved for hospitalized symptomatic patients with indications for CT, um, that portable radiography could be used when medic medically indicated, and that radiologists should familiarize themselves with the appearance of COVID-19. And the reason for that is going to become um, even more clear throughout the rest of the talk. Now, I want to talk about some radiographic presentations um, quickly, and I'll talk to you about several of these cases. This is a male in his 50s who presented. And you can see this is a typical, rather typical appearance of um, COVID-19 on chest radiography. You can see that this can be used for quick confirmation if you clinically suspect these cases even before the PCR is done or is back. Um, it can be used to evaluate alternatives. What if this patient had a, a huge low bar pneumonia? What if they had a large pleural effusion? What if they had a pneumothorax that you didn't know about? That could be used to evaluate alternative diagnoses or additional complications or other diagnoses. Also to evaluate severity. Um, you know, is most or most of the lungs involved or only a small portion of the lungs involved that can be relevant for patient care. So all those things are reasons why we might want to do radiography as a first step. Um, this is the typical peripheral appearance. It's typically nodular and multifocal. It's typically, it can be bilateral, it can be lower zone, and it's often bilateral. Here's another case. In, in this case, instead of bilateral opacities, we have a peripheral opacity right here. And we don't see much on the right side, though. On the chest CT that was done for different reasons later, you see that this opacity corresponds to the one on the left. And in addition, in addition we see multiple other opacities that were harder to see on the right on the chest radiograph. And again, this is not a specific appearance. It's reminiscent of an organizing pneumonia. And many things can have this peripheral um, diagnosis. Uh, distribution in the differential diagnosis. And some of those things are septic emboli, uh, eosinophilic pneumonia, all types of other organizing pneumonias ranging from cryptogenic organizing pneumonia to drug reaction um, to uh, connective tissue related lung disease can present with this sort of peripheral pattern. Here's another appearance that you'll see a lot. You know, you see these peripheral opacities, they're bilateral, they're sort of multifocal, multilobar. Here's another one. Uh, th this is actually the same patient who progressed one day later. So these opacities can 
um, rapidly worsen over just a short time course. Uh, here is another case that was given to me from my institution. And on day one, you see these typical bilateral peripheral opacities. Some of these are quite round. And then on day four, they have worsened, they've become more diffuse. You see not only the peripheral opacities, but also some central opacities and more diffuse opacities. So um, it's uncertain whether in some of these cases, uh, a lot of these central opacities could be due to something else like development of ARDS or whatnot. Uh, this is the CT that corresponds. We have a lot of both peripheral opacities and also some central opacities in this particular case. Here is though um, a variation that unfortunately you're gonna see Look on day one, um, I'm a chest radiologist and I still don't see anything going on in the lungs here. So this is normal. On day two, uh, essentially normal again. So this patient eventually tested positive, had few days of symptoms, respiratory symptoms, and was uh, positive for the virus. So chest radiographs can be negative, especially in the early setting, but um, they can also be negative in well into the course of the disease. Chest radiographs are not specific though. Uh, you can see that two patterns here are very re reminiscent of the patterns we've just seen. This patient though had H1N1 pneumonia several years ago and has ARDS. So other pneumonias can do it, especially viral pneumonias. And this one has cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or COP uh, from an unknown cause. So both of these can cause this organizing lung injury pattern. Now, what does the literature say about chest radiography before we start talking about CT? Well, this was a nice case, a nice uh, series in radiology, nice study of 64 patients. Most of them were symptomatic and 91% um, of them had a first PCR that was positive. That's actually a nice uh, sensitivity for PCR. This is higher than some of the other uh, literature on PCR. But the gold standard in this was PCR in general. So if they didn't have a first positive PCR, they went on to do more testing, second and third, until they got their gold standard, which was PCR. So all these 64 patients eventually had a positive PCR. But let's look at radiographs. Um, with that um, PCR positive, out of all those patients, only 69% had an abnormal first chest radiograph. So if you're thinking about using chest radiographs to absolutely exclude COVID-19 uh, pneumonia, you can't really do that because you're gonna miss about a third of the cases. In 59% of the time, both the uh, PCR, first PCR and first chest radiograph were both abnormal. And interestingly though, here's where we can pick up some cases that we might not have seen um, with the first uh, negative CT, uh, PCR. We picked up 9% uh, additional cases or six additional cases that had an abnormal chest radiograph even before that uh, PCR was positive. So it can overall increase the sensitivity of testing. But let's look at the distributions and appearances of the opacities on chest radiographs in that study. Can we use them to deduce anything about um, what we should be looking at? Well, in a lot of cases, we had consolidation, we had some hazy ground glass opacities, but notice how we didn't have these in all. So that means that if you use these things to try to discern whether something is COVID-19 or some other type of pneumonia. For example, if we take the peripheral predominance that I've talked about so far, 51% of the cases had that, but that then means 49% did not have that. So even these typical findings, it's very treacherous to use those to sort of discern whether you're dealing with COVID-19 or some other type of lung pathology or type of pneumonia. Even um, you know, the bilaterality, 63% had bilateral opacities, but then that means that some uh, relevant um, other percentage did not have them. And then even lower lobe predominant, only 63 were lower zone predominant. So when someone asks me, how certain are you that a certain chest radiograph represents uh, COVID-19 or not, I typically use the peripheral predominance that I've talked about to Assess, assess whether I'm really, really concerned about it. But then remember that um, certainty scores don't mean much when you have such a large um, percentage that actually do not have this so-called classic or typical finding. And this is actually one of those cases. This is a focal opacity, it's quite round. And I would start to think as a chest radi radiologist about could this be a malignancy? Is this a mass? Is this in a round area of other pneumonia, sort of a segmental uh, pneumonia? from bacterial infection. Uh, this is actually a case of COVID-19 and we'll see the CT of this case in just a few minutes. What about this chest radiograph? This is just diffusely abnormal and I see a little bit of cardiomegaly perhaps. 
Um, I'm thinking, could this be edema or could this, could this be some other type of viral pneumonia? Could this be pulmonary hemorrhage? Could this be a lot of other things? It's really a nonspecific chest radiograph. This is COVID-19. It's diffuse. It may even be central. It's COVID-19. So what about this one? This is also COVID-19, another case of just sort of diffuse hazy opacities, maybe some septal thickening, interstitial thickening bilaterally. This could be a lot of things, a lot of infections, a lot of diseases could have this appearance. What about this one? This one has almost a low bar appearance down here, this dense retrocardiac capacity at the left lung base. This could be aspiration, could be a bacterial pneumonia, other types of pneumonias, could be low bar atelectasis. Um, and then we have some diffuse hazy opacities elsewhere. So is this a case of ARDS? This is kind of a nonspecific appearance. This is COVID-19 as well. And this patient went on to have really a bad ARDS and the lungs are almost completely pacified after uh, the initiation of more support measures. And what is the role of CT? Let's look into that. We've talked about radiographs for just a few minutes, but let's talk about CT the rest of the time. There are certain benefits, of course, and the benefits are when you have a shortage of PCR kits or it takes time to do the PCR, time to get the results, there are some people dealing with days or even weeks of delay. Um, it's, it's better than that. It's better than nothing, right? Um, it's also more sensitive than just a single PCR alone in some cases. Um, and it can be used as a problem solving tool. And it can also pick up unsuspected cases. And we'll see a few of those cases in just a few minutes from my files. But remember, there are a lot of risks. There are patient risks from involving patients and in being scanned in rooms that have had other patients who've had COVID-19. Um, um, there are staff risks uh, involving being exposed to patients with COVID-19 when they may not need to be. And there are also false negatives and false reassurances that one can get from a false negative CT when the patient actually has the disease. Uh, there can also be false positives. What if we call COVID-19 pneumonia on a case and we divert resources away in those cases that they need to be diverted to some other uh, place in the hospital. So it's not without harms, but the ACR does acknowledge that um, CT should not be used for screening or first line diagnosis. And the reason as we see it, we've said is that chest CT can be completely normal. This is an unpublished case um, from China and uh, we have a negative CT and we know that this patient had COVID-19. 56% uh, of the time, CT can be negative. This is Adam Bernheim's study from Mount Sinai, showing that in early symptomatic patients, 56% of those can have a negative chest CT. And CT, as we uh, are seeing, is nonspecific. And we'll get into a few of those cases in just a few seconds. But how can CT be used? It can be used in a lot of different ways. It can be used for primary diagnosis. It can be used for screening in some cases if you don't have access to a lot of PCR kits. It can be used as a triage measure, even while you're waiting for the PCR to come back. Um, it can be used to assess complications in known COVID positive patients. But it's important to remember that we don't really have studies of the outcomes of the use of chest CT in any of these situations. And the reason is that we're in the middle of a pandemic. We haven't had the time to study this, nor would we expect anyone to be able to study all the factors involved. And some of those things that could affect the study and the cohort uh, groups would be the prevalence of the virus, the population health, whether you have a lot of smokers or a lot of um, overweight in your population, uh, the medical resource, including the, um, uh, the likelihood you have enough PCR kits or CT resources, and then also just your imaging resources in general, availability of chest radiographs and CT in general. So there's so many other factors, no one has really been able to do this, to control for all these factors yet, and we wouldn't expect that to be done yet. So we have to keep an open mind about the use of CT, I think, in a balanced perspective. Here's a case where I think CT does a really good job, and um, this opacity was found on a radiograph here of a patient uh, who had a mild cough. And so uh, what happened with this patient is that there was a PCR that was negative. The patient continued to have a mild cough, a second PS PCR was done a day later, and that was also negative. And so this patient went to CT to sort of see, okay, well, are we dealing with something else entirely or what can CT show us? And I'll show you the CT. These are the CT images. And we see in the left um, upper lobe here, we see this area of regional opacity. And this opacity is ground glass. It has a few areas of consolidation in it. 
It has some so-called septal thickening in it that you could call crazy paving when it's superimposed upon this ground glass, this hazy abnormality. And it really doesn't, it has a little bit of a rounded appearance, but other parts of it are just very indistinct. So all in all, it was classified as um, sort of an indeterminate appearance. We said that, you know, you need to really look into doing more testing for COVID-19, but knowing that this could also be another type of viral infection or another type of pneumonia, or even, um, you know, less likely, but still possible, a malignancy. What happened was this patient actually went on for sputum testing and the sputum was positive um, for COVID-19. This patient had COVID-19. So that's one way that CT can really serve as a problem solving tool and can push you into doing more clinical testing even after you've had a couple of negative um, swab results that are PCR negative. And so um, acknowledging that and acknowledging that some, in some settings, even um, CT is even gonna be used for primary diagnosis of um, COVID-19, the RSNA and Simpson uh, have published this really nice article on structured reporting for chest CT. And they break things down into the four categories here. Um, you can have a typical appearance for COVID-19 and we'll go over that, indeterminate, atypical, or negative. That means no features of pneumonia. And so at my institution, we are currently using this to report um, these cases that are asked to be reported on suspected uh, COVID-19. But it's important to know that there can be a distribution of these various appearances that we'll talk about. And we still do not know what percentage are we going to see that are going to be the so-called typical appearance, indeterminate, atypical, and then even normal. Uh, we may have a situation where, depending on our cohort groups at our different hospitals, we have mainly typical appearances of CT as it's defined by the RSNA, ACR, STR consensus guideline. We may have some typicals and a lot of indeterminates, but we may have this situation where we have mostly atypical cases and indeterminate and just a few typical cases. And again, this depends on, okay, what are we using for our first method of diagnosis? Are we sending all the patients who have typical chest radiographs? Or are we just never seeing a CT on those patients because it's so typical on chest radiographs or because the first PCR is already positive that we don't see many typical cases? Are we gonna see that situation? Or are we gonna see this situation? We just don't know. It depends on prevalence of disease around um, the Cashman group. It depends on the host factors. It depends on severity of disease when you see it, whether you see it early or late. And it depends on the reason for doing a CT. So a lot of variables go into what appearances we might see. And so again, certainty scores, if somebody says, well, can you assign a percentage certainty score to that? Are you 25% sure, 80% sure, 100% sure? I don't know how to answer that question. I can just tell you that these are the typical appearances that we see both in the literature and in our practice, and then the other ones that are less uh, specific for the disease. So let's talk about um, some other findings here. Um, CT can also be used not only for describing disease, but also in known cases of COVID-19 can be used to assess complications and associated diseases. Now, some of those complications, remember that um, patients who are in the hospital have a higher risk of pulmonary emboli. Patients who have ARDS have a known higher incidence of pulmonary emboli. And um, so we wouldn't be shocked to see pulmonary emboli in COVID-19 patients. And here we have a combination of peripheral ground glass opacities and consolidation. Some of these look a bit like an organizing pneumonia. So this would be a typical appearance for COVID-19. But look at these areas. These look more wedge-shaped down here. So they could be due to pneumonia, but they could also represent pulmonary infarcts. And that's actually what they represented on this uh, pulmonary embolism CT that was done for suspicion of pulmonary emboli based on a change in clinical status. So you see pulmonary emboli right here, and we saw them in other lobes, multiple other lobes on the, the chest CT. So we're not doing chest CT at my institution as a routine method of diagnosis, but we're doing it as a problem-solving tool and to assess other suspected complications in some cases. Now, what are the patterns that the RSNA guidelines, consensus guidelines talk about? Well, let's start with the typical patterns because that's what I'm talking about right now. That's what I've been showing you. The typical patterns are peripheral, ground glass opacities and with or without consolidation. Uh, they tend to be round. They can be round ground glass opacities like this. And you can also see reverse halos 
uh, in some of these cases. And this is a sign of some sort of organizing pneumonia lung injury in many cases. And so how can CT help us in when we're talking about these categories? Well, this is a very confusing radiograph. Um, some of you uh, may say it's relatively normal, but look in the right upper lobe. Uh, this is a very hazy opacity, very hard to pick up at the lung periphery, but something is abnormal here. Uh, this needed clarification based on a confusing clinical symptoms, based on um, confusing radiography. Um, and so a CT was done, look at the CT, it shows bilateral peripheral ground glass opacities and look at the axial images. We have bilateral, some are round, very well defined. Some have enlarged vessels within them, the so-called thick vessel sign that has been described in COVID-19 pneumonia. And so this case is a typical case uh, according to the, or typical morphology according to the RSNA ACR guideline. Here's another case that would be classified as a typical morphology. You have peripheral ground glass opacities, band-like opacities that can be seen in organizing lung injury. And this is the case that I started the presentation with, another case of COVID-19. So very typical appearance by those guidelines. What about this case? Here highlights another role for CT. This patient came in for a routine cancer follow-up CT scan. And my fellow called me up and said, what do you think about this case? Are you concerned about COVID-19? And she was the first one to suspect COVID-19 on this particular case. And we can see that we have band-like opacities within the um, lung periphery. We have ground glass opacities, multifocal. And this case would be classified as typical morphology for COVID-19 um, on chest CT. And um, we alerted the uh, physicians who referred the patient and the patient was diagnosed with COVID-19 via PCR um, within a day. And what about this case? We have another typical appearance of COVID-19 pneumonia. We have multiple ground glass opacities. We have a so-called reverse halo sign here. And the reverse halo is this. It's a band of consolidation with ground glass opacity in the central portion of it. So it's sort of ground glass that's within the central portion and surrounding that is a band of consolidation. So it's a reverse halo, not a halo sign. So this is in the RSNA categories as a typical appearance um, morphologically. Here's a rare case of a uh, halo sign, uh, sorry, reverse halo within a reverse halo in a teenager, courtesy of um, Michael Chung and Adam Bernheim. Here's another reverse halo sign or so-called ATEL sign, very round opacity. You have this linear consolidation around it. It corresponds to the radiograph I've already shown you. This is a case of COVID-19 with a typical peripheral appearance with a uh, reverse halo sign. Here though is another sign that's called the halo sign that can be seen as subset of patients. And this is a nodule with surrounding ground glass opacity. And remember, this is not specific for COVID-19, this can be seen in a lot of infections, including other viral infections, including invasive fungal infections and other things. But even the typical patterns are not specific for COVID-19. These are patterns here that are actually not COVID-19 pneumonia. This one is um, H1N1 uh, pneumonia. So all sorts of viral pneumonias with, with or without ARDS can have this appearance. And this one has an appearance that is um, that of an adenocarcinoma, and this is not a COVID-19 uh, patient. So the question has been asked in the um, literature, how well do radiologists do in distinguishing cases of COVID-19 from other types of pneumonias? Well, um, there was one, one uh, article recently, this one, that was a nice article uh, that claimed a very high uh, specificity of CT. And what they did was they took uh, PCR positive patients, 219, uh, COVID-19 patients, and they match these, um, these cases with um, other non-COVID viral pneumonias. They chose those pneumonias from the medical record, from reports of the radiology reports that had things that were consistent with pneumonia in the impression or impressions that said highly concerning or, or very concerning for pneumonia. And they had a viral panel to go along with these where the viral panel was positive. And this, th those are the 205 cases they included. Now they had a variety of seven different radiologists read those cases and try to discern which ones do you think are COVID-19 and which ones do you think are non-COVID-19 uh, cases. And they claimed a 97% accuracy. And I can say that while um, you know, some of these cases are very, very suggestive of COVID-19, 
um, the real uh, accuracy in um, clinical practice is probably lower than that. And the reason is that some of the, it's hard to prove that some of these cases were not uh, selected with some degree of selection bias because they were deemed very consistent or highly consistent with pneumonia in the reports. And a lot of pneumonias, um, viral pneumonias, are not going to be very, um, maybe atypical uh, on chest CT. And so simply selecting for these patients may have led to a little bit of a selection bias in this case. Also, I can show you that, let's look at some of the reader variation in some of the cases that were called COVID or not COVID. This case I would have thought would have been a typical pattern for COVID-19 because it has this band-like peripheral pasty, some ground glass. Um, it looks like an organizing sort of lung injury pattern. And this was called non-COVID by uh, one of the readers. Uh, this case, I would have thought, well, this is more central in distribution. We have a little bit of peripheral opacity here, but some of it's central, a lot of it's central. So I would have thought, could this be indeterminate, actually? And this was called COVID rather than non-COVID uh, etiology. And look at this case. This has a uh, reverse halo sign and a reverse halo sign here. And I would have thought, well, you know, this has been reported a lot in COVID-19, so this is probably a a typical case, but this was actually called non-COVID um, in the case series. So um, while this is a very good article and it exposes the fact that we um, do fairly well when we look at CTs and try to predict what is a typical appearance, uh, there's still more work to be done, but very good article. Uh, what about indeterminate patterns? It's that second RSNA category. Now this includes things that are not the typical appearances that I talked about. They can be diffuse ground glass, non-peripheral opacities, a few small ground glass opacities that do not have rounded morphologies, and things like this. This is a case from my institution where you had ground glass, um, really just diffuse ground glass. We had some peripheral, some central, perhaps most of it central in the upper lobe here. And on the radiograph, it doesn't really look that, um, you know, it could be a little mild edema, could be some other viral pneumonia. It doesn't look that typical. So that would be classified as indeterminate. This one on the radiograph just looks like it could be a lot of various things. Could be edema, could be another pneumonia, could be hemorrhage. This is the CT. So instead of having a mainly peripheral predominance of opacities, we have opacities that really have no particular distribution. Some are central, some peripheral. I will say that there's some hint of band-like um, opacity here that could be viewed as an early organizing lung injury pattern. So maybe that's a tip off, but still, this case would probably be uh, graded as indeterminate by the RSNA categories. And here's another case that would have been graded as indeterminate. And it improved um, just one or two days later and two PCRs were negative. So presumptively this is a negative case with negative lab values and it rapidly changed, uh, which probably says there was something else altogether. And um, what's that third category? So the last category in the RSNA guideline is reserved for things that are usually not COVID-19 related. So things like cavitation really not reported in pure COVID-19 um, involvement. Uh, what about tree and bud? Well-defined central lobular nodules. Those have not really been reported. Uh, low bar consolidation uh, and segmental consolidation. Also septal thickening with a pleural effusion. And what about lymphadenopathy and pleural fusions themselves? Well, uh, these were, were really termed as uh, atypical in some of the early reports, but since then, quite a few groups have published on these two things, and a lymphadenopathy alone and a pleural fusion alone, they're so common uh, due to edema and due to reactive things, um, and even due to COVID-19, that they're not deemed really so atypical in the RSNA guideline. This is a case that I showed you already that had some mild lymphadenopathy. And here's another case I showed you already of COVID-19 that has some mild lymph node enlargement. So it can be seen it's not an incredibly unusual. These though are cases that can be deemed atypical. You have this interlobular septal thickening, fistural thickening, looks like interstitial edema. You have pleural effusions bilaterally. So this would have been graded atypical for COVID-19 pneumonia. And here we have um, some well-defined central lobular nodules. You can talk about some of these as tree and bud nodules. You have a little septal thickening. So this would have been graded as atypical for COVID-19. Now this case is another case that you would say is atypical. You have this round um, area, this mass-like area of consolidation, and you also have um, tree and bud nodules around it. And this is a patient who uh, went on a vacation to California. This is a case from a couple of years ago and came back with a case of um, acute coxie. So fungal infection there. 
What about the exceptions though? There are some cases that do have those atypical features. It's important to know that they cannot completely exclude the presence of COVID-19 and nor should anyone expect them to. This is a case in, from Seattle that was published online um, as a New England Journal of Medicine resident case where you had some central lobular well-defined trimbo nodules. And this case actually was thought at first to be something else like an aspiration or some other viral pneumonia and turned out to um, be COVID-19. And not to say that this could not have been something else superimposed upon COVID-19, but this patient was uh, a patient who had COVID-19. Now, in those cases, why might you see a variety of patterns? Why might you see some patients with um, both an atypical pattern um, in COVID-19 and also typical patterns? Well, one reason is that um, in the published and unpublished literature right now, a lot of people are showing that there is not an insignificant percentage of other viral infections um, associated with uh, COVID-19. And you can see that in this case, um, almost 22% of the group that had COVID-19 and were positive for SARS coronavirus 2 actually had other viral infections. So some of these combination cases may be co-infection with other things. But, you know, in spite of the value of these uh, RSNA categories, I think that we're going to uncover more and more cases that are very problematic. Now, this case almost looks like it should be deemed atypical for COVID-19, uh, but you can notice that it, it's very focal. It looks like a round area of consolidation, maybe even a mass here. Um, if they fall into patterns with very mild disease or blends of two or more different patterns, I found that those are hard cases because the patients that have mild disease are less likely to be symptomatic and they're more likely to be something else like either another type of pneumonia or even just a small amount of aspiration or some other, something else that is infectious inflammatory. Now the blends of two different patterns can be misleading because there can be an atypical pattern blended in with a typical pattern. So what do you do? Um, it's important to realize that in the RSNA guidelines to qualify as atypical, you really need to have the absence of typical features or absence of indeterminate features in order to qualify as atypical. So just because you have a blend of patterns, if you think that you're seeing a typical pattern, uh, technically that should be graded as the higher category, which is gonna be typical rather than atypical. And we went over the typical appearances just a few minutes ago. Now, what about this particular case I showed you? Well, elsewhere it has things that look more like uh, they could be in keeping with just a typical appearance. We have multifocal round um, ground glass opacities with some areas of solid uh, opacity or consolidation. So that would sort of bump this up to a more typical appearance. What about this one? This one's hard to gauge because this was the only thing, this is courtesy of Dr. Chung and Dr. Bernheim, who again were part of the first group to describe findings on CT of um, COVID-19, but this is the only thing that was on the CT and this is a COVID-19 patient. What about this case? Um, this case is confusing because the patient um, presented with three days of diarrhea and bloody stool and no respiratory symptoms, no lung symptoms whatsoever. And you can see the major abnormality here is not gonna be anywhere else but down here in the right lower lobe. And you can see that this is the predominant abnormality you have a area of nodularity, solid nodule here with adjacent ground glass. It looks sort of like a halo sign. And in retrospect, you can go back up and you can see a little few areas of subtle ground glass and nodular consolidation in some of the other areas of peripheral lung, but definitely a confusing case because of its um, relatively confined nature to the right lower lobe. And presentation with GI symptoms. So gastrointestinal symptoms can present in up to 50% of these patients at presentation. And just, th this is my last slide actually, and just to see how well you're paying attention to uh, the talk and the RSNA categories here today, um, I'd like you to just to look at these patients. So we have one patient, two patients, patient three, patient four, patient five. And so five different patients, and what categories of RSNA consensus guideline would you apply to these cases? Um, so let's just start to look through them. So this one has peripheral ground glass, has some uh, so-called thick vessels or enlarged vessels within those, um, peripheral predominance, bilateral. So I would say, oh, well, this is typical pattern, right? COVID-19 pattern. This one, much the same. It looks like a so-called typical pattern with this peripheral opacity, some consolidation, some ground glass. Let's turn our attention to this one. This one has almost a uh, semi-lobar consolidation appearance here. That would be atypical. 
we have some clustered central lobular nodules that look like they're tree and bud nodules, which would suggest that they're atypical for COVID-19. And so I would term that atypical. What about this one? Again, peripheral ground glass, a little bit of septal thickening. So this is so-called crazy paving, where you have septal thickening and ground glass opacity. This has been reported commonly in COVID-19. So this would be term typical. And this last case, well, this one looks more atypical because you have this sort of central predominance, you have um, some clustered central lobular nodules, some of these look like they're tree and bud. And so this looks like um, either an indeterminate or even an atypical pattern. Uh, so how well did you do? If you said that this patient has COVID-19, this one has COVID-19, this one has COVID-19, you would be absolutely incorrect because I'll tell you, none of these patients on this page has COVID-19 pneumonia. These are all old cases. These are from a couple of years ago. This one is influenza pneumonia. This one is H1N1 pneumonia. This is parainfluenza pneumonia. This is RSV pneumonia. And this is hantavirus pneumonia. Not a single one of these patients who has very typical patterns of lung disease has COVID-19 pneumonia. And so I think that underscores the fact that we have to be very humbled by this disease. We don't quite understand it. It has a lot of appearances on CT and on chest radiographs that are atypical or that are nonspecific that overlap with other diseases. And we're still learning every day about the use of imaging in the disease. Um, and I encourage you just to follow up, read the literature, appreciate the imaging appearances of COVID-19. Um, I've talked a little bit today about the role of imaging and the, role, the major role of PCR as a gold standard. And I hope that you appreciate some of the limitations and some of the benefits of the literature that's come out in the midst of this pandemic. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over for um, any questions that we can try to address. Perfect, thank you so much uh, for your time, Dr. Little today. And thank you for all of you for joining us in this noon conference. Before we move into our Q&A section, just wanted to remind you that this conference will be made available on demand on mrionline.com in addition to all previous noon conferences. And on Monday, we will be joined by Dr. Barbara Hamilton for a noon conference on trauma in the community. Dr. Little, if you could please open the Q&A feature and answer a few of the questions that are in there, that would be great. Okay. Um, let me just start from the top here. And um, there's a question, what is the method for confirming recovery? Is it possible to diagnose recovery without positive PCR test, like in asymptomatic patients? And how long does immunity last? Um, well, I think those are the, um, you know, the million dollar questions and everyone um, around the world has teams working on the question of how long does immunity last? That's very relevant to vaccine questions. And as a reminder, I'm a radiologist, I'm not an immunologist. And, um, you know, I know that a lot of very, very smart people are working on that right now, that question. Um, what is the method for confirming recovery? Well, um, it is typically clinical. Uh, and not imaging. It is um, both uh, PCR and symptom recovery and time. And so imaging does not really at the current moment play a role in assessing recovery. Now, I need to say that one interesting topic that has not been addressed completely in the literature yet is, um, is there lasting lung damage in patients who have recovered from um, COVID-19? And we know that there is some, from some of the papers, there is some residual, um, uh, you know, reticular and band-like abnormality in patients who are several weeks out or a month out, but we don't have long-term follow-up yet. So that's one thing to look for. Um, so let me, uh, let me look at some other questions here. How can we, one of the questions is, how can we differentiate between um, COP, which is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and COVID-19? Well, um, I don't think you'll be shocked after the whole talk to know that there is really no way to distinguish between them imaging-wise because many of these cases look like an organizing pattern of lung injury that's really not specific. And it can be seen in a drug reaction um, with organizing pneumonia. It can be seen in connective tissue-related lung disease with an organizing appearance. It can be seen in other viral pneumonias with an organizing appearance. So, um, really, the gold standard remains laboratory testing, such as the PCR for the, the virus. Um, so let me go to some other um, uh, questions here. Uh, when there are chest CT findings, does it mostly imply the patient has pneumonia 
infection of the lower respiratory tract or ARDS. Um, and if the patient's symptoms are limited to uh, upper respiratory tract infection, shouldn't the CT be negative? Isn't it thus straightforward that CT can be negative in some patients with COVID-19 and shouldn't be relied on? I think that's a great uh, set of observations and questions because it is in part what's going on here. Remember that the um, COVID-19 is not just a single um, organ um, disease. It's a multi-organ disease. So we shouldn't be surprised if there are no lung findings in some of these patients. We should not be surprised from the literature if there are um, patients who have pre uh, predominantly have GI symptoms or upper respiratory symptoms who do not have um, findings on CT. So that is uh, very true. So we've got to look at, I think this is a disease that we don't know uh, enough about and it's multi-organ. So in some cases, even though a patient is positive for SARS coronavirus 2, uh, there may not be lung findings. Uh, let me look at another question here. Um, how do you distinguish symmetric posterior par parallel bands from compressive atelectasis? Well, in general, I would not feel confident in suggesting um, a typical, so-called typical pattern or suggesting that perhaps the patient may have COVID-19 unless I saw, um, you know, other findings within the lungs. One band within the lung periphery uh, could be due to anything, could be due to prior fibrosis, could be due to atelectasis, compressive atelectasis, as you say, could be due to other things. So um, I would want to see more to be uh, confident about even suggesting that the pattern falls into a typical uh, pattern. Let me go to the next one. Um, uh, let's see. As the role of microembolic disease becomes greater concern in COVID-19 infected patients, might the peripheral distribution be related to ischemic disease? Um, oh, this is from a friend of mine, uh, Evan Stein. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, that is a good question, and that is, again, a million-dollar question. Some of the early autopsy studies are showing uh, some interesting vascular findings um, in the lung periphery and um, showing some uh, thrombogenic uh, states throughout the literature in general. So um, a lot of groups are currently looking at that question, so that's a very good uh, question. It's unclear right now whether there are higher rates of uh, thromboembolic disease, for example, or thrombotic phenomena in uh, COVID-19 than there are in general in other cases of ARDS. Um, and then there's another question. Second quiz case has ground glass opacities in a central distribution. Why um, is it typical then? Well, um, I may have misspoken, but I meant to say, I thought my, uh, I mentioned there that that's a reason why I would not think it's a straightforward typical case. When you have a more central predominance of opacities, um, that sort of indicates that it's an, uh, that is a, uh, at least an indeterminate pattern. So uh, that case was meant to show that, um, that we probably shouldn't have suggested that that was COVID-19, um, a typical pattern. Uh, let me look at some other things. Um, uh, let's see, in my routine CT reporting for suspicion of COVID-19, if the PCR is not done, I am getting to see CTs where lung parenchymal changes are typical of COVID and associated with pleural effusions and lymphadenopathy. How confidently can I report typical pattern in the presence of pleural effusions and lymphadenopathy? That's a very uh, good question and a very difficult question. Uh, just remember though that just having pleural effusions and just having lymphadenopathy, that can be seen in a lot of different conditions. So I think you have to look at in, in the setting even of COVID-19. So remember that these patients, they, they come to us with pre-existing cardiac conditions in some cases, pre-existing diseases, pre-existing lymphadenopathy. They can even have some lymphadenopathy, lymph node enlargement from COVID-19. So um, I would just say, if you're seeing uh, parenchymal changes that you think uh, could be typical of COVID-19, um, don't, don't let the presence of pleural effusions completely dissuade you from uh, actually mentioning that and being concerned about COVID-19. We still don't have large scale data on that um, on, uh, in our cohorts in the United States on the, the incidence of pleural effusion in patients because they have so many other coexisting uh, diseases. Um, here's another one. Um, most of our cases come from rheumatology departments where the patients already have basal, lung, interstitial disease, 
is there any particular pattern to rule out COVID-19 and them? And uh, I would say the short answer is no, <laughs> uh, because um, COVID-19 can have a pattern that is identical to organizing pneumonia and connective tissue related lung disease. I will say though, that in my experience, I've had um, a few patients now who've had some pre-existing um, parenteral findings that are peripheral that are due to known connected tissue related rheumatologic disease, and then have come in with new opacities that are peripheral. And in those patients, um, when you have a patient who has chronic disease and then suddenly has this new peripheral pattern, um, unfortunately, we've already had several cases in which we've, we've had tests uh, positive for um, SARS coronavirus 2 in those uh, patients. So things that are new, I would say, are important there. Um, so let me go on to some more questions. Um, uh, Let's see, how do you diagnose COVID-19 in elderly patients with underlying interstitial lung disease if there are no prior studies? So that sort of is a similar question. It can be harder in the setting of background lung disease to make uh, diagnoses. But again, I would say that if you're doing comparison scans, if you have a lot of scans for comparison, just compare, are you seeing a lot of new opacities that are concerning, that, so, uh, that are peripheral or, or that are even not peripheral and that just look like pneumonia, um, that's how you would diagnose any sort of new disease, right? So you wanna compare older ones, you want to discern what is old from what is new, and then go from there and use your clinical judgment. Let's see, is there a radiographic lag between clinical improvement and imaging clearance? Uh, well, that's another question um, that we need to know more about. But in general, there can be some dissociation, right, between clinical symptoms and imaging. Uh, as I showed in the cases that were published in radiology cardiothoracic imaging from that nice paper uh, on the Diamond Princess cases. So um, it's unclear whether um, serial imaging is actually uh, a good thing to do or not. In fact, some people would say do not do serial imaging unless there's a really good reason to to do it. So um, it's really unclear right now how much of a lag there is between clinical improvement and imaging clearance. Um, it's a very uh, interesting question for more uh, research. Uh, let's see, let me look at some more questions here. Okay, so here's a good one. Do you use typical or atypical terms in your chest uh, uh, x-ray reports? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, if you look at the data there that I presented from chest radiographs and how many turn out to be uh, peripheral and um, basilar predominance and bilateral, you find that a lot of them are actually not. A, a um, significant percentage, approximating 50%, do not actually have what you would call a classic appearance on those uh, radiographs. So I really, I hesitate. Um, to actually put typical and atypical in, in my chest radiograph reports because I fear that um, people uh, may use, when they don't see that, they may use that as an indication that I'm not thinking as much about COVID-19. When, in my experience with now looking at hundreds of chest radiographs with um, COVID-19 patients, uh, or patients with COVID-19, um, I've seen quite a few, quite a few, um, both normal uh, presentation radiographs and also very atypical radiographs that look like they're central or very subtle opacities or just a single opacity that's unilateral, um, even things that look like masses or nodules. And when you, when you add up all those atypical appearances, um, I really hesitate to dissuade someone from thinking about COVID-19 uh, uh, pneumonia. But on the phone, I can, I can, you know, I sometimes say, well, you know, this is a uh, appearance we see a lot in COVID-19. Um, in my reports, I can say um, there are opacities um, which have been described in COVID-19, but I, I hate to um, use, to my knowledge, there is not a um, multi-organization um, organi uh, consensus yet on using the terms typical or atypical in chest uh, radiographs yet. Um, let me look at some more uh, cases here. Um, what about, what about other system involvement, cardiac, CNS involvement, and et cetera? So that's one area that has been investigated. It's being increasingly investigated now. There are um, reported cardiac findings. Um, there have been reported 
myocarditis cases. Uh, there have been reported arrhythmias. There have been a lot of other um, multi-organ involvement cases. CNS cases have been reported. Um, I have not been specializing in looking at those uh, areas of involvement, but you can look to the literature and you're going to find some early cases there and some case series and some studies that are looking at those other uh, findings. Um, here's another question. Are there other conditions that demonstrate halo signs or reverse halo signs? Yes, there are. And that's one of the problems here because the imaging is not um, specific. So let's take the halo sign first. So the halo sign can be seen in other infections, including other viral infections. Um, it's been described, well described in fungal pneumonias, including invasive aspergillus and mucor mycosis um, and other uh, pneumonias. Um, halo signs can also be seen in things like uh, malignancies, adenocarcinomas. Um, there are a lot of different things that halo signs can be seen in. And, and um, that again is a central solid nodule with surrounding ground glass. And also the reverse halo, which is the um, consolidation on the outside and the ground glass on the inside. That was classically uh, described in organizing pneumonia that was actually not due to infection and um, can be seen in organizing pneumonia due to um, drug reaction, due to connective tissue disease, related disease, um, and can be seen in also in other infections, including invasive fungal infection. And so these signs are not uh, specific, the halo sign or the reverse halo sign. They can be seen in a lot of different um, things. And um, let me see, I'm just going down uh, the, um, oh, um, do you, do you recommend point of care ultrasound for first line imaging? Uh, that's a topic that is being studied a lot right now and some groups have published on that. Um, I haven't been following that literature as um, well as the CT and, and radiographic literature, but I know there's a lot of excitement about that. Um, however, let me just give you a, a caveat about point of care ultrasound. Um, remember that whatever is true of CT is likely going to be true of point of care ultrasound uh, because if you have a negative CT, um, you can't exclude the presence of at least the virus in the patient. So you can't by, therefore, you can't really use point of care ultrasound to exclude um, COVID-19 if, if your aim is to do that. So, but I know there's a lot of excitement about the findings on ultrasound of, um, of this disease. Let me get to another question. How long do imaging findings persist after recovery? Would you expect them to persist after clinical recovery? Um, this could make the utility of CT limited to assess recovery, uh, especially when false negative PCR is suspected. If I understand that question, it's just asking, you know, the time course of findings. Well, we know that um, some findings can persist into recovery, and the question is, how many of them persist? Um, what's the severity? Is there any lo lasting lung injury? Um, those questions are not completely understood. The answers are not completely known right now. But we do know, you know, as, as the cases I've showed you, you can have patients who are asymptomatic who have CT findings. So it wouldn't be shocking if, if there were a significant lag in res complete resolution of these CT findings. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of questions here about pulmonary embolism associated with COVID, and the uh, jury is still out about that. Um, remember that any hospitalized patient has, um, especially those with um, acute lung injury, uh, there are studies showing in other pneumonias that the incidence can be elevated of pulmonary emboli. Um, now, I can tell you that some of the strategy here, uh, obviously the D-dimer and other inflammatory markers can become quite elevated in a lot of these patients. So our teams in some cases are um, doing uh, some um, ultrasound of the ex lower extremities um, you know, by the, the bedside and trying to not to do as much uh, PECT because of you know, utilization of those rooms and all the um, issues that go along with that. And also uh, because um, you may pick up some uh, DVTs and other uh, uh, thrombotic phenomena that you can pick up in the, in, by the bedside and not have to move the patient to the scanner. So, but the word is still, uh, the word is still out on that. So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a good topic for in investigation right now. Uh, 
Um, okay, I think I may just, I'm kind of running out of uh, breath here. <laughs> so I may kind of wrap this uh, up. Oh, let me just look at this one other question. Any reason for the opacities to be rounded in this case? Um, I think the word is still out on that. As we get more uh, pathologic uh, proof of what is actually going on in terms of the lung injury that's going on, I think that we're going to know more about why some of these opacities are rounded. Um, you know, again, uh, a lot of this is an organizing lung injury pattern. So whatever the reasons for organizing the to look the way it does, they're likely the same reasons. And a lot of that has to do with the actual histology of the um, small airways involved and the lobular structures of the lungs and that perilobular structure of the opacities. Um, and, but I would say, I want to take this question to actually note that the uh, reverse halo signs, you know, those um, uh, areas of peripheral consolidation with internal um, ground glass, a lot of those are actually incomplete reverse halos. They're only a half halo or a part of a halo. So um, that's an interesting finding in these cases as well. Um, but it still looks like an organizing uh, pattern. So but anyway, I think I will wrap that. I'm sorry I didn't get to get to all of these wonderful questions. Um, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think I'll wrap things up uh, now. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Little, for your time today. We appreciate you being a part of this noon conference. And thanks to all of you for participating in this noon conference. Again, this will be made available on demand at mrionline.com in addition to all previous noon conferences. Please follow us on social media at the MRI Online for updates and reminders. Next week's schedule will be posted on the website within the next uh, day or so. So please register for those. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you and have a great day.